Good morning. On behalf of the Institute of the Americas, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to today's special presentation by Mexico's economic, Economy Secretary, Tatiana Flutiere, being organized as part of the Institute's Hemisphere in Transition webinar series. As we kick off this morning's presentation, I wanna thank the sponsor of our webinar series, the Burnham Foundation, and in particular, its founder, Malin Burnham. I also wanna thank the University of California Television for partnering with the Institute on our series. Secretary Cloutier's presentation today comes at a pivotal time as she leads Mexican President Lopez Obrador's efforts towards economic recovery amidst the current challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, the United States is Mexico's most important trading and investment partner. In the case of the United States, we, um, we trade more goods with uh, Mexico than any other country. In 2019, two-way goods trade between our two countries exceeded $677 billion. At the same time, Mexico and the United States are not without their trade differences, as is the case on issues related to energy reform and genetically modified corn. So there's a lot to talk about, and I'm looking forward to a rich and timely presentation by Secretary Coutier, as well as our discussion to follow. At this time, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, Ambassador Jeff Reed Avido. Ambassador Davido is currently the senior counselor with the Washington DC based global business consulting firm of the Cohen Group. Ambassador Davido is the former president and CEO of the Institute of the Americas, leading our organization for over five years following his 34 year career as, um, in the foreign service. During his career in government, Ambassador Davido served as the assistant secretary of state for Western hemispheric affairs, as well as the US ambassador to Mexico, Venezuela and Zambia. Ambassador David is the author of the book, U.S. and Mexico, The Bear and the Porcupine, a bestseller in Mexico. At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ambassador David. Jeff, take it away. Thank you, Richard. It's a great honor for me to be here with my old friends at the Institute of the Americas. And it's a great honor for me to have the opportunity to introduce our guest of honor, uh, Secretary Tatiana uh, Cloutier. Uh, the secretary has a long history and tradition uh, in Mexican academia and politics. She's a graduate of the Autonomous University of Nuevo Leon, did additional studies at the International uh, Institute of Technological uh, uh, Studies uh, in, in Monterey. She has participated as a, both a student and a lecturer and a panelist at Harvard, Berkeley, London School of uh, Economics. She has been uh, a firm supporter of President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, uh, including a coordinator uh, and campaign manager for his successful bid for the presidency. And she now serves as Secretary of uh, Economy uh, Madam Secretary, welcome. We're very pleased to have you join us this morning. Thank you. I presented on the 19th of January, I presented um, uh, a program as to work on the recovery of economics in Mexico. And first of all, we decided we were gonna be working on four strategic points. But we have, first of all, the development plan, the National Development Plan of President Lopez Obrador, which is based firstly on three main points, which has to do with innovation, diversification, and inclusion. And President Lopez Obrador has been working on this and trying to pull the target as for all of us in the government to point out on these three points. When we're talking about diversification in the sense of economics, we're talking about uh, finding new markets and not only having the markets that traditionally were being considered as especially Canada and the United States because we have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, markets in those places. On the other hand, uh, when we're talking about innovation, obviously we're talking about the great, uh, well, the world 
is looking and is uh, facing the, the, the greatest advantage when we're talking about innovation and especially with all uh, the internet, we were not able to be talking at this moment. Innovation will not be on the source long, uh, long time ago. So we believe that we have to work not only in Mexico, but worldwide in innovation a lot, put a lot of effort on that, put a lot of money also on that, and especially on the area that has to do with health, because the pandemic has shown us that we need to do a lot on this sense. And then when we're talking about inclusion, um, in inclusion, we're talking about uh, President Lopez Obrador has been working uh, since long ago on how to um, give a hand to those ones in our country uh, that uh, were being left behind and um, that people that have been left behind, we have a, a lot of population that uh, needs to be included, but not only that, we also are talking about indigenous people and with the pandemic, we're having a major, uh, mm, we're facing another target, which has to do with women. Women have been left behind again in this, or with this pandemic, not only in Mexico, but also, uh, but also on uh, the, um, also on the on the market, and we have we 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 have to do a lot of working together as for uh, reskilling those women in the use of uh, technology and also in new areas of development, so they can be re-included and not left behind. As Epal said it, in Latin America, it's happening. So with that in mind, we all this supported in what we're talking about the sustainability. And we, um, we believe that not only pandemic, but also uh, the world has shown us the need to look and find a new ways to do in business. And when I'm talking about the new ways to do in business, I'm talking about the need to have but to think about the green, uh, green, uh, the green business, talking about uh, the circle economy, and those are like uh, fundamentals that we need to be considering while working on the strategics for the growth of the economics worldwide and obviously in our country. So then we have these four um, strategic points. The one has to do with the internal market. We're talking about the industrial policy and technology and development. And on that one, we're talking about how to have Mexico or our government supporting buying Mexican, but not only buying things done in Mexico, but having in all the exportation inform, uh, products more local or more, I'm gonna talk America, thinking about the, 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 the USMCA, uh, talking about uh, American content, if we are able to um, increase the American content of the products we export, we will be uh, improving our economy very easily, well, not very easily, but we're go gonna be improving it uh, pretty much. And on that one, we assume that if we have supply chain working uh, all together and relocating uh, enterprises that uh, would like to take advantage of the TEMEC. We have a great, great advantage on that. Then on the next one, increase the add, added value locally. That was one of the points that I just addressed. And then uh, on the third one, welfare productive industrial parks. This one is something we've been working with the private industry. And we're thinking about doing five or three of these um, welfare productive industrial parks that uh, have with it not only the business part, but also the social part of it. What are we talking about over here is that we have places for uh, kids to be taken care of. So the parents can be working with no, uh, with not thinking what are my kids or not thinking what am I gonna be doing? And also taking care of adults because we have found that women are the ones at least in our country in Latin America, the ones that have been in charge for a long time of taking care of kids, but also taking care of parents. And that doesn't allow them to be uh, working 
freely and be working without having uh, the worry of where are their parents or where are their kids. Then we have the promoting the supply chains locally and based suppliers. And that, that's the point that I'm talking about. How can we uh, be uh, working on relocating uh, enterprises and also finding a new way of having uh, the product, the supply chains being worked more locally and not uh, finding products some other ways. On the other one is encouraging industry competitiveness and technology upgrading. And this is one of the main things we are focusing at this moment. And that has to do with uh, working with a small business. So the small business can change uh, very fast. We already done this in a sense and in, in using um, or reconverting or training even a small businesses as to change to the uh, technology, technological upgrading and the use of e-commerce. And then we have the financial support for a small and medium sized enterprises. Over here on this last one, we have been working a lot, especially with the small, uh, uh, the small and medium enterprises in training, not only, as I said, on e-commerce and digital, but also we have trained them on some um, accounting and financial uh, steps. And we have also been doing some uh, work as for them to get together with some other uh, small businesses and do associations as to fa face the challenges that we are doing with the pandemic. On the next one, we have investment promotion and we here have the sim simplified administrative and procedures and requirements. We have found and work uh, with international um, associations and international institutes. What we have seen that uh, one of the major challenges we have is to simplify our procedures. If we are able to lower down the number of uh, requirements that any business has as to open, or as to continue doing the exportation and all the processes, we will be able also to uh, make the business and the import and export procedures easier for everyone. So we're working on this one with uh, the OCDE. We're using, uh, working with CAF and some other institutes and using technology as to make all the procedures easier. We know that's a big challenge, but we are working not only with the federal government, but also with the state governments and with the local governments, because this is one of the issues that is demanded uh, mostly. On the other hand, we're uh, working on having a, a, a one window uh, uh, reception. So especially for the business that come from the outside, have an easy way to finding solutions and not have to be knocking on all the doors. On the other hand, we have enough improving conditions for national investment and foreign direct investment. And uh, as we said, we're working with the state governments and with uh, our go government as to uh, let them know what are the things we can offer to the uh, international investment, but also taking advantage of the uh, position that we have at this moment with the TEMEC, uh, with the United States being our biggest uh, neighbor, and also the market that we have uh, with the United States and with uh, Canada. On the other hand, we have the coordination and, and cooperation between the government enterprises and investment funds. And we're working over here a lot with infrastructure. I have over here three projects that we can talk about uh, pretty strongly and that are located on the southern part of Mexico. Over here, I will be talking mainly, uh, one of the promises of President Lopez Obrador was to pay a debt that we have had for a long time on the southern part of the country, especially with nine states. And over here, we're building two main projects. You may know that Tren Maya, that Tren Maya has or is, uh, it's gonna be changing a lot the southern part of Mexico. Also, we have the project of the ISMO. The project of the ISMO, it's a, a, a train that connects the South, I mean, the Pacific with the Gulf of Mexico. 
and that one is gonna be uh, finished by the end of this year. So after the, the uh, around or next to the, the, the project of the ISMO, there are 10 points of development that we're working on and especially with infrastructure. And we have another one, what we call Plan Oaxaca. Plan Oaxaca has 22 projects around uh, these nine states on infrastructure and that those ones are like the, uh, uh, like the main focus where we are putting investment for the international and local funds and also from the governments. And we believe that this is gonna be like a lot of support for developing and for making a, a lot of progress in that area that has been left on. And also having communication and especially for uh, transporting and exporting to a new, new areas of the United States, especially the parts of Miami and the states that we have there. Most of the exportation that we have done at this moment, even though we have the main uh, exportation products to the United States, uh, they are located in six or seven states. We need to address, when we were talking about diversification, we need to address new areas, but also new products to be exporting. And we're working on that. And we believe that the ISMO uh, uh, project that we are just gonna finish is gonna allow us to be making new markets in the Eastern part of the United States, but also to Europe and in other parts of, of the world. And then we're talking about encouraging North Americans uh, regional economic cooperation. And uh, that is, uh, we, as you know, with the TEMEC, we have a lot of uh, interchange uh, of uh, import and exports, but also we need to uh, make a stronger relation, especially with the problems we face at this moment with the pandemic, and we have seen that we have shortcuts in some uh, in, in, in products. So we need to address this, especially in all the vehicle industry and in all in the health industry. On the next one, when we're talking about international uh, commerce, we have first the increase of Mexico international commerce. As I was saying, we need to face not only looking at the United States, but looking and making a stronger relations. We have at this moment 13 treaties with the rest of the world, with 50 countries. Then um, we want and we are working on uh, making those uh, commerce stronger and also uh, renewing the ones that need to be renewed. We were uh, just addressing one with uh, England. And then uh, the other one has to do with protects Mexico's interest in the international trade agreements. As you have known, especially being in the United States, you know that some of our products of the agricultural area have faced a difficulty in, with some of the producers of the United States. So as the United States protects and works on their, uh, protecting their own industry, we have to do the same with our products. This year, we increased the exportation of the agricultural products in 6.6%. And we, we believe and we are sure we can do even uh, more on that. And in that sense, we need to protect those products that the United States uh, believes that uh, affects their, uh, their producers, which we believe does not have anything to do with that. On the other hand, as I said, we're celebrating new trade agreements. And on the other hand, we're talking about implementing Mexico trade agreements and meet the obligations. We are, uh, since we have new obligations with the TEMEC, we are training, uh, especially uh, in the areas of new compromises that we acquire, we are training our people here in our country. For example, one of the main things we're doing on this training has to do with all the labor uh, reform. The labor reform, it is not only something that we uh, agree because we had a, a, an agreement on the international trade with the United States and Canada, but that was something that President Lopez Obrador has believed and he did it even before we came into a new agreement. 
And these new changes in the labor uh, reform have to be uh, known with, for all the enterprises, with all the uh, labor community. And we're doing a lot of uh, uh, training on that, not only uh, uh, with the business and the labor community, but also on the uh, labor uh, offices we have, because we're changing also the way we are addressing that internally on the federal government. Uh, the last point we have over here has to do with the regional, uh, the, the development regional economies and local industry. We have something that we call COFINESES. The COFINESES is uh, um, a group that we form in all the regions of our country where we have businessmen uh, mainly that understand what is happening in the region, what are the problems they're facing, but not only as a region, but also as a business. For example, we have worked a lot with the shoe industry, with the textile industry, and we have seen what is hurting them and uh, focusing on the things that they are facing and the problems they're facing. We're finding very local uh, solutions as for them to keep on moving. But on the same way, we are uh, working, uh, and, and again, I go to the southern part of Mexico, as I was telling you, we have a program for developing the southern part of our country with not only the Plan Oaxaca that had 36 projects, but also we have 200 more projects that uh, are very well addressed and focused on these nine states that I talked to you about before. Then. We're talking about the booth, boost a strategic industry and job creation. And over here, what we're talking about is looking for all those industries that are strategic and that not only help us create new jobs, but also help us create jobs that have a great impact and a better pay because we not only want people to have a job, we, we believe that we need better jobs and better pay jobs. So we're talking a bit over here about aerospatial uh, industry. We're talking about more developed vehicle industry. And we're talking about also a lot of uh, research in the health industry, which we, where we see a lot of potential. As I can tell you at this moment, actually yesterday, uh, President Lopez Obrador and the group uh, destined to research presented already that we are working on a vaccine, a Mexican vaccine, if we, if we can call it on that way. And not only that, but we're also working with all other countries in doing research as for the vaccine and other solutions for uh, health issues in our country. And when I was talking also about the, the, the future industry, as I said, we're talking aerospatial, we're talking about um, the, 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 the health and even seeing a new future in a new way to doing a traditional uh, uh, tourism, changing to a new way to address it and talking even about medical uh, tourism. What we are doing at this moment, it will, uh, since I came in, we are seeing, uh, we open uh, conversations with the industries that were, were not being uh, heard maybe before, and we have had already 153 reunions with industry. We have had, uh, we have talked with the embassies to see what are the new ways that we can address uh, uh, new relations and cooperation as to improve uh, the business and to improve the, the cooperation between the nations in uh, the areas that they are uh, more, they have more potentials. Those are the things that I will be leaving on the table at this moment as what we have for the recovery, uh, uh, recovery uh, actions that we have planned on the economy. And I will prefer that we open the, uh, the table as for you to ask questions, which is always the best ways to have a better relation and not only have somebody talk on a one-way uh, uh, position. Madam Secretary, uh, thank you very much. You've outlined a very expansive agenda and we all wish you luck. And uh, 
Thank you. And, and success. Uh, there are many questions that our viewers have sent in to us, and uh, they largely deal with the interpretation of the Temet. That is the what I prefer to call the second NAFTA. Uh, first, one of the important elements is specifically in Canada and the United States was the new emphasis on green programs, green energy. Could you talk about what your government is doing in that regard? It is obvious that uh, uh, steps by the government uh, have limited or, or will further limited uh, green energy in Mexico. And how do you uh, foresee dealing with the green issues? And in that regard, uh, the question of green energy, of course, is tied in with the question of electricity and hydrocarbon reform. Uh, TAMEC uh, does have provisions which prohibit the uh, preferential treatment of state-owned enterprises, which in Mexico's case would be, of course, Pemex and the CFE. So there is a connection between green issues, electricity reform, uh, the treatment of foreign investors in the energy field. And we could talk about these separately, but uh, since we have you, I'd like you to give us your view about foreign investment in energy, foreign direct investment in energy, the future of green energy, and this question of potential uh, difficulties uh, and conflicts within the Temec uh, uh, construct in relation to the primacy uh, and preference for uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. That's a long question and I apologize, but please. No, I, 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 I ask you to get more, two more questions and we go with the three of them together, if, you, if that helps you. Okay, uh, let's, let's talk about the, uh, the question of uh, the uh, uh, conflicts uh, in agriculture between the United States and Mexico. We have already seen some this year. Uh, these are not, uh, this is not a new problem. There's uh, many of us have lived through the, let's call them the tomato wars and other such things. How do you see your relationship with the USTR and uh, the United States in uh, more generally in terms of resolving agricultural conflicts? And a final question is, Mexico uh, seems to be moving against the uh, importation of genet genetically modified maize, corn. Uh, and this is a major export from the United States and a major uh, element involved uh, in the production of food in Mexico. So all of those things taken together, uh, let me stop there and hand, hand the platform back to you. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the, the green energy. We're talking about the green energy. Uh, first of all, uh, President Lopez Obrador uh, has with the Tren Maya that I believe it is one of the projects that uh, if I would have known that we were interested in that, it would be very interesting to have a whole presentation from the Tren Maya and the ISMO. El Tren Maya has a 50%, 49% of, have 50, 51%, 49% of electrical energy. They have 10 uh, uh, camps of, uh, pan with panels for producing the electricity. I think this is something that we, I mean, not a lot of people know and they believe that we're just stepping behind on that side. And that's one of the ways uh, Mexico is achieving the promise they have had in the green energy that we are uh, working on. On the other hand, the same project, Del Tren Maya, has, uh, has been working and is gonna be working with communities where we have the uh, self-production for 0.5 megas, where it is not uh, uh, like uh, the production has not to do with profit, but it is like 
auto consumption in the communities. So those are uh, areas where we are uh, achieving the promises that we have on moving on with the green energy. When we're talking about the electricity and with Pemex, we have a okay. We have a reform at this moment with the electricity, and as you know, that Temec uh, had or President Lopez Obrador when they signed with the United States and Canada that the Temec he like left out the area related to electricity and also uh, uh, Sener, which is the Secretary of Energy, is the one responsible for the. Um, the, the uh, oh, my word came out. The, it's the one in charge of the rules and the one in charge of uh, moving the agenda in Pemex and electricity. What have we said to the people that are uh, that are seeing this as something going against the uh, the US uh, the USTR? I tell you that uh, uh, some of them have already moved on. Uh, legally, and uh, we have in Mexico uh, something that is called uh, Amparo, and they have already moved on that way. So what we, uh, we tell the people is the electricity reform, it is in a way in a, um, in a legal standby, we can say that, and uh, the Senate is the one in charge of all this policy. So I actually, I cannot really tell you a lot more on that one. Uh, if you wanna go deeper on that, I surely will uh, be happy to do a meeting or do a reunion with people from the CFM, from PMX, as for you to go deeper on the side. On the green one, uh, on the green energy, I tell you already what we're doing on uh, Tren Maya. And also we have work in a small farms, uh, in green farms and a, a circle economy as to keep on moving with the small businesses on this area. When we're talking about the agriculture, um, when, when we're talking, okay, we have some other projects that uh, uh, I think they already move on over here with some of them. Uh, um, okay. I can I, I don't know if we can you can help me maybe we can put this on the on the on the on the presentation because we have already some uh, projects that work uh, as to have the first green uh, the green uh, the first green island in Mexico that is going to have uh, solar energy and in Cozumel and also Islas Marias has a project that has a lot to do with the uh, solar energy. We also have um, in Tulum another, present, uh, another project that has to do working with photovo uh, photovoltaica, como digo? Well, with photovoltaica solar energy. And uh, no, no. so those are things that we have had already moving on with the green energy. If I move on with the agricultural relation with USTR, I tell you that we have a great relationships with them. We know that being partners and being neighbors, uh, and being neighbors uh, has uh, always the goods and bads. We're gonna be neighbors forever. We both understand that. And I think that this relation goes even farther than just thinking about uh, uh, tomatoes or not tomatoes. As with neighbors, I think it is more mainly like, uh, how can I say that? I, I always see this relationship and I have uh, even make fun with some of the, the persons we talk all the time. It's like being married with the only difference that over here you cannot walk away. Not Mexico, neither the United States can walk away in this relationship. So we understand that. What are the, the problems we have been facing or we have on the table at this moment? We have one with uh, cucumbers. We have one with bell pepper. Uh, we have had already one with berries. The berry was solved already. And I believe, and I'm pretty sure that we're gonna solve pretty easily the one with the cucumbers with the bell pepper too. 
Why? Because I think those problems were raised on a moment on a, a political election. And when we have an election on the table, I think all the groups move and even the people that are running for a position or not try to move and make a lot of noise around something that it is not necessarily well supported. I believe that uh, these noises move on in one side of, uh, uh, of, of the border that would be in Mexico and they move the same way on the United States. I have, I'm, I'm the daughter of an agricultural from Sinaloa. He grew tomatoes, he grew bell pepper, and he, and he grew uh, cucumbers uh, 30 years back. And I remember since then all the time talking about what was happening in Miami with the tomato. So I understand these are things that happen all the time and we always have find a solution. So I don't see any problem in finding a solutions, understanding that there are some times when you win, there are some times when you stay on the standby, and there are some times when you lose. And I see this relationship and moving in playing chess. Sometimes you move the queen and sometimes you have to let uh, the other side uh, make the move of the queen. On the other hand, we also have face not only on the agricultural area, but we also face uh, problems uh, with the trim at this moment. And I, I believe this has something to do with um, on finding better ways of uh, catching trim, being more into the respect of uh, the uh, protecting the, the, the turtle and we are moving on that. So that's this relationship helps us, helps us move on in finding better ways to address uh, situations in protection the environment. And I think we have the same thing uh, when you were talking about it, and I'm gonna move on on the corn and the uh, OMG uh, uh, and Productos Genéticamente Modificados. Oh, uh, M. MGOs <laughs> products because it has to go the other way around. Uh, for example, on the on the on the um, on the corn, uh, what we have, uh, what President Lopez Obrador has said, he signed a, 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 a an statement where he uh, we 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 work in two directions. He said that we are not going to be buying any any. Um, any, uh, we're not gonna be importing uh, the, the corn for human consum consumption uh, if it comes from the MGO's uh, product, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna be buying the corn and for uh, animal consumption. And I think that this is the, the part of the, of the, of the moving and, and, and addressing when are we talking about green, when are we talking about moving, uh, taking care of the environment. We believe that we have to take care of the environment, but we have to take care of the human beings too. And that's the moving on when I'm saying you playing chess. Uh, we have to play chess, we have to see what hurts you, what hurts us, and where do we find a better solution for both countries, understanding that there we have things that uh, hurts us, you have things that hurt the United States, and we have things that help, uh, that have to move on in finding a way to uh, move on uh, with both countries when we have to give and take in one situation or another one. That's the way that we see the agricultural relationship, and we believe that sometimes, as I said, you win, sometimes we win, and sometimes we both win. Thank you. Uh, you have a tremendously big agenda. Let me raise one specific issue that was very, very important last year uh, at the beginning of the COVID close down. And you referred to this in your presentation. And that relates to supply chains. What we discovered uh, in the first months of uh, the COVID close down that the supply chains were interrupted in that there was no mutually uh, agreed uh, position between Mexico and the United States on the question of what is essential industry. The US had its list, Mexico had its list. Uh, there was a lot of confusion 
uh, it was a new problem in that sense. And hopefully we will never face it again. Uh, but are you working with the US government and other governments on a uh, regularization of supply chain mechanisms? I think it was a very important historical uh, period in which people on both sides of the border realized just how important the supply chain is and how vulnerable it is. Can you talk a bit about that? Yes, do you wanna give me another question or do you want me to, to address that one alone? I'll give you another question, but I okay. don't wanna to talk too much. Uh, I think the, the basic question that I, I run into uh, when dealing with American business is, and I'd like to ask you whether you're, you're seeing this as well, the, ac the actions of the Mexican government in relation to energy, the uh, electricity reform bill, the new hydrocarbon reform bill, seem to be creating in sectors of the American economy beyond the energy sector, doubts about the advisability of investing in Mexico in that it appears that the rules may change halfway through the game. Would you comment on that? And what assurances can you provide to uh, foreign investment investors as they think about direct investment? Obviously, uh, we, I think that's when we saw how important it is that relationship between our countries. And if I'm thinking about what President Lopez Obrador and President Biden talk about in the last meeting they have, they were talking about the, 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 the supply chains and not the supply chains, but at the end, the, the, the need to uh, conform like blocks in, in, if we're talking about uh, international wise, no, we're thinking about America, we're thinking about maybe Asia, we're thinking about uh, Europe. And in that sense, we cannot see each other separately. And if we're talking about supply chains, we have already talked with the uh, people from the United States. We have had uh, meetings already with all the people in charge of the different areas from the USTR, from uh, the economical minister, with all, we have talked with everyone. And on, on, a, on a high level position, but we also already working on uh, the technical uh, areas as to uh, not face the same problems we face. We face problems in different ways. First of, one, of, of, of all, the one of supply chains. And I think uh, that we all learn the need to have a, 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 an everyday uh, talk as to find solutions in that way and understanding that we have that the MEC sign already, we move on fast or as fast as we could as to find out which ones were the essential business that were gonna be able to be open. I think that we learn already, not only as a country, but as a, uh, as a region, what or what, I mean, how can we have to be working on which ones are gonna be called essentials? We know already that we have a lot of products that are part of the supply chain of your main, of the main uh, uh, business in the United States. And for example, with one of microchips that you, we all are facing in America, uh, the United States has been working and looking, uh, and we already sent them yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, on a study that we did on microchips we're working to finding solutions as for uh, if anything happens again, uh, that we hope we are already prepared in many, in many other ways. We don't stop this uh, moving on of supply chains. And we have worked on protocols. Uh, we have worked with the IMSS, El Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, the one in charge of uh, not only health, but also of, of, uh, supervising the uh, uh, security in the business. They have already protocols as for to see what you have to be doing instead of just closing, what you have to be doing and following and doing a, uh, the, the, those protocols as for you to continue working and what are the, the percentage of uh, 
the workers that you can have on a business depending on what color of the of the of the difficulty of the uh, pandemic is in the city where you are working on on the other hand we have also another situation that we learn as a country on when we have that problem in texas on i think it was on december or january okay no it was on january that the problem that we uh, uh, live in texas when we're talking about not only supply chains, but we were talking about gas, we learn as a country that we have to move on and that will come and connect my answer to the second question you're raising. When we're talking about the energy sector, no? we have work and we talk almost every, every other week with the embassy of the United States in Mexico. And we're looking for uh, moving and bringing gas uh, to the southern part of the country, but also to the states of Central America, I mean, to the countries of Central America, and bringing gas over there. The United States is willing to make investment there. The business of the United States are also, or, or some business in the United States are also interested in investing there. So nonetheless, uh, we have, uh, at this moment, a uh, 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 reform going on on the electricity uh, and electricity sector, we have seen that uh, the United States, the government itself, uh, France and Germany and even other countries are interested in investing in Mexico. And we are having obviously a, a way to uh, support and making and, and having them the, the, the protection of their investments for them not to uh, believe or not to see that something can be happening to their investments. We have, and we have, uh, uh, as I said before at the beginning, we have already in Mexico, what you know, the Amparo, we have some other ways to find sol solutions in case somebody believes they are being, um, they're being, uh, how do we look? They're, they're having a, an unfair treatment in the way they are being treated in their investments. And I tell you that we have a, had a lot of talks with a Pemex and Cener and the business as for them to find in solutions and to see what are the, the new ways to find the, the investments all together. And in those ones, mainly, for example, what I'm seeing that they're working is uh, uh, CFE is having like, 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 the, like the head or is being in charge and they're doing some, I don't know if I will call it partnerships uh, in the investment. And those are the ways they're finding the solutions for the investments of those areas. But I tell you that there is a lot of interest in the United States, uh, France, and I'm not if I'm not mistaken, it would be Germany in investing on the southern part, especially in gas. Thank you. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for your um, presentation and, your, um, and the response to the questions. Um, the final question is, Mexico right now has a great opportunity for reshoring investment from Asia uh, to North America. Some companies have already made those investments. What is Mexico doing to attract this investment? We are uh, talking with uh, every week, we're talking with some uh, companies, uh, especially the ones that we are interested in bringing them for, the, uh, for, for, for uh, the supply chains specifically. We're focusing pretty clearly on which ones are the products that we need to uh, provide a whole supply chain. And we're talking specifically to the CEOs of those companies. We're having meetings almost every uh, other day and we're looking for them to uh, talking about why, why is the reason, I mean, why are those reasons that they have as to be moving to our country? And we're giving them, uh, giving them uh, some uh, facilities in different states as for them to move on to our country. One, one final question that come is, um, given the ambitious uh, plans that you've put forward um, and given also the austerity challenges that Mexico faces like other countries, how is Mexico planning to pay for some of these new initiatives? Okay, first of all, one of the things that uh, at this, uh, I was a congresswoman before, and we uh, we uh, 
We approve the budget, the Trail Maya budget has been taken care of. Uh, uh, I don't see that there is any problem on the Trail Maya. It's been very well put on or separated the budget for that. And the social programs, what they're doing at this moment, it's uh, we changed the law in a way that the constitution actually on the uh, uh, article four, where it, uh, it says, that the social programs that are already by law, which has to do with the people over 60, uh, uh, 65, no, 68 years and older and the kids with the special needs, which so those are the ones mandatory, are going to be, uh, those are the only ones that are mandatory. With the other ones, some of them uh, are not mandatory. And what you keep on, on those social programs is if there is money um, there, you keep on moving and supporting those programs, but the money for the Tren Maya and the money for the ISMO, it's there. Well, thank you very much, Madam Secretary. With this, I want to thank um, um, you, Madam Secretary, um, the Secretary of uh, the Secretary of, of Economy. I want to thank um, our sponsors, um, uh, the Burnham Foundation. Um, I want to thank also Ambassador Jeff Davido for his um, uh, moderation of this uh, panel. And thank all of you as participants for taking part. So thank you all, um, and we look forward to having you participate in future Institute programs. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much.